There are two basic approaches to understanding the scriptures as a person takes a bird's eye view of God's word and attempt to comprehend God's plan of, for human history. One is a dispensational theology and the alternative is what is called covenant theology. Now, though there are many variations within these two camps, these are the two ways that theologians in the last several centuries have attempted to understand and clarify God's plan for mankind. Covenant theology is the basis for the teachings of the Lutheran Church, normally the Presbyterian Church, and almost always Reformed churches. Some modern-day covenant theologians are R.C. Sproul, John Stott, Martin, Lo Martin Lloyd-Jones, and others. In contrast to that, there are, there are those who believe in dispensational theology. And again, we do, do not want to impose our theology on the scripture. We want to derive our theology from the scriptures. And so during this class hour, we want to compare dispensational theology with covenant theology. First of all, let's understand the basics of covenant theology so that we can then interact with it biblically. First of all, as far as its definition is concerned, covenant theology is a theological system which attempts to develop the Bible's philosophy of history on the basis of two or three covenants. And I say that because some covenant theologians differ with each other regarding this. Now, as a, we talk about a philosophy of history, it has been defined as a systematic interpretation of universal history in accordance with a principle by which historical events and successions are unified and directed towards ultimate meaning. In other words, the idea here is that a philosophy of history looks at mankind and God's plan of the ages from a certain perspective. Okay? In contrast, dispensational theology is a theological system which attempts to develop the Bible's philosophy of history on the basis of the sovereign rule of God. That the purpose of human history is for God to glorify himself by demonstrating the fact that he alone is the sovereign God. And this encompasses all of God's dealings with men, saved or unsaved, along with angels, along with nature, and along with nations. Now, as we think of the history between these two theologies, it's important to understand the covenant theology as a system began in the 16th and 17th centuries. It was then that theologians attempted to develop a system of theology that encompassed a philosophy of history. For example, Louis Burkhoff, a prominent covenant theologian, wrote, and I quote, in the early church fathers, the covenant idea is not found at all. Now, what is that saying? Now, just think about this for a minute. The early church fathers, who are they, first of all? Who are the early church fathers? We're not talking about the apostolic age. We're not talking about the time of the apostles. We're talking about the people who came after them for the first couple hundred years. And what Burkhoff is admitting is this. There was no such thing as covenant theology then. In fact, it is very hard to look at the church fathers for a couple hundred years and even find those who didn't believe in a literal earthly kingdom that's going to be set up in the future when Jesus Christ returns. Premillennialism, Christ's return before the kingdom, was the normative understanding of eschatology or prophecy or future things. They believed that Christ was going to return and set up his kingdom. And so what's interesting is early church history really favors again our understanding of the Bible, those closest to the apostles themselves. Number two, the real founder of a well-developed covenant theology is a guy by the name of Gaspar Olivianus. Not Gaspar Melktos, but Gaspar Olivianus. Burkhoff wrote that under the writings of Olivianus, the concept of the covenant 
became for the first time the constitutive and determinative principle of the whole system. In other words, this became the defining point for the whole system known as covenant theology. This theology became popular in Switzerland and Germany and then passed to the Netherlands and Scotland and England. In other words, Europe was dominated by covenant theology on the heels of the Reformation here, or, in, or, or during the Reformation. In 1647, the Westminster Confession of Faith in England became the first confession of faith to refer to covenant theology. Number three, covenant theology was introduced to America primarily through the Puritans. Through the Puritans. Now, you know anything about Puritans? You would know that what did they do is they impose a lot of Old Testament law on the church. Now, why did they do that? Because they viewed the church as having replaced Israel. And they believed in replacement theology. They didn't distinguish law versus grace. And so they imposed that. So what did they do with, quote, heretics? Kill them. By the way, what did Calvin do in Switzerland to those who were heretics? Do you know that Calvin was directly responsible of putting to death over 50 people for heresy in Geneva, Switzerland, most of them women? Now, Calvinists don't like to tell you that, <laughs> but he did. Why? Because they took the law and put it on the back of the church. Plus, there was no distinction between government and church. Do you know who gave him directives as to whether he could preach or not? The city government did. There was no distinction between church and state in Switzerland. That was true with Zwingli as well. And that was one of the reasons the Anabaptists and the Reformation got into trouble because they would say there needs to be a distinction between the church and the government. Yes, the church can influence the government. The government should not be wedded with the church. And when you do that, you got all kinds of problems. In fact, to this day, by virtue of Henry VIII, remember, wanted to have another wife, he was not only the head of the England, but he became the head of the Anglican Church. Anglican Church. And so the two were wedded, which creates a lot of problems when that's the case. Same was true with the Puritans. One of the points I'm trying to make, though, is the fact that the implication is that covenant theology has always been around and dispensationalism as a Johnny-come-lately is just systematically not true. Now, let's evaluate some of the teachings of covenant theology. And time doesn't permit a thorough examination, so we'll be brief. As we think of the teachings of covenant theology, let's first of all talk about the covenants. Now, when you think of the covenants, what do you think of? Mosaic, Abrahamic, Davidic, Noahic, right? When covenant theologians talk about the covenants, what do they think of? Not those. That's not what they think about. They think about three covenants. One is called the covenant of redemption. And it teaches that in eternity past, God the Father granted the Son to be head and redeemer of the elect. Now, do you see partly why Calvinism and Reformed theology here, or covenant theology, are oftentimes wedded. Because notice, he's the redeemer of the who? Elect. Where we believe that he's the redeemer of all, but only those who believe get redeemed. Okay? And so that's why there is this connection oftentimes made between the two. Now, is it true that God the Father from eternity past has planned for his son to redeem the world? Not the elect, but the world. Is that true? Yes. 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver and gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from the fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So yes, we do believe that Jesus Christ was involved in the plan of the Father to become the Redeemer of the world. Number two, they believe in what's called the covenant of works. 
which teaches that God made Adam the representative head of the human race. Now, is it true that Adam was the representative head of the human race? Is that true? Yes, that was true. By the way, do you ever see this covenant made there in the uh, Garden of Eden? Do you ever see covenant made? No, it really wasn't. But it is true, Romans 5, 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sin. And so this is true, but it's never referred in the Bible as a covenant. There's nothing called a covenant of works. And then thirdly, they would believe in the covenant of grace that teaches that God promised salvation through faith in Christ and the sinner accepts this believingly promising a life of faith and obedience. So they'll say it's by grace, but in doing so, you pledge and promise to live a life of faith and obedience. Is there any problem with that? That sure sounds a lot like what? Works, right? Sounds like works. In fact, that phrase is really a quote from Burkhoff, a covenant theologian. Now, what is pro problematic immediately with this? Do you see these things called covenants in the Bible? I don't. I don't. What's ironic is we actually are truly more covenant theologians than they are. Because we believe in the covenants. <laughs> the biblical covenants. And we even call them covenants. We believe in that. But they view this all differently because their frame of reference is different. So do dispensationalists believe in covenants? Absolutely. The Bible recognizes several of them. And in our series, we'll examine the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant and the Palestinian covenant and the new covenant and so forth. So what really is the difference between covenant and dispensational theology where the rubber meets the road? Up to this point, you may be thinking this is a lot of philosophy and semantics, but does it really matter? And I will say it matters immensely. So do dispensations believe in the covenant? The answer is, is yes. The biblically defined not the theologically defined ones. Now, what are the theological... Oh, here we have a picture there. Do you have that on your handout? Okay, got a nice little picture there taken from Dr. J.B. Hickson. And these aren't all the covenants, but these are major. Kind of like the Rose Bowl, the granddaddy of them all, is the Abrahamic covenant. From there comes the Palestinian. I prefer to call this the land government. I don't really like the word Palestinian because it's not really reflective of what it is. There's the Davidic covenant. There's the new covenant. And notice, if you notice these, these are all unconditional covenants. The Mosaic covenant is actually separate here. Why? Because it's conditional. The Abrahamic covenant was before law. Israel and the law here, these three, which all branch off of these. And you see, all of them ultimately get fulfilled in the kingdom to come. Including the new covenant. You know, I'm personally of the persuasion that the spiritual blessings quote of the new covenant are not part of the church which many people take that view. I mean, good Bible teachers, people I enjoy have taken that view over the years. But I've come to the conclusion in the last few years that I'm totally convinced the new covenant blessings do not apply to the church, they apply to the kingdom age. So what are the theological implications of all this? Number one, covenant theology teaches that the millennial kingdom of God will not be literally fulfilled. They don't believe there is a future kingdom on earth. 
They spiritualize Old Testament passages to make them refer to heaven, not a kingdom on earth. Now, let's go to a few passages. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Just go to Isaiah chapter 11 for a minute. In Isaiah 11, verse 1, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. By the way, who's the branch? Who's the rod? Who comes from the stem of Jesse? David, and beyond that, this is referring to the descendant of David, which is Jesus Christ, right? Okay. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, <clears throat> nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Notice the meek of the where? The earth. Okay. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, is that referred to in Revelation 19 when he comes back? And with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. By the way, from the word of God, does he destroy the armies at the Battle of Armageddon? Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. Now what does wolf mean? Wolf, what does lamb mean? Lamb, what does leopard mean? Leopard. Lie down, young goat, young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fat lean together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall, will, shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. The weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's is that going on today? Well, I might for a moment. <laughs> yeah, you know what covenant theologians say? Yeah, they, they, a lot of times they believe we're in the kingdom right now. That's why you keep hearing about the kingdom. We're advancing the kingdom. Why are we not? We're not advancing the kingdom. There is no kingdom yet. How can you have a kingdom when you don't have a king on earth? You can't have a kingdom without a king. The king hasn't come back. Oh, yes, he is. He's in your heart. He's ruling your heart. And so they spiritualize all of this. In fact, you know, in Genesis chapter 15, God made very clear the promised land from the river Euphrates to the great river of Egypt. It tells you exactly how much land is promised to Israel in the future, the descendants of Abraham. So how do they deal with that today? They say, oh, that's all spiritual. That's in your heart. So really, is it from the lung to the liver? Is that the boundaries of the land? Some of us, bigger boundaries than others, you know. <laughs> yeah, they spiritualize all this. But you know, the Jews of Jesus' day believed in a literal kingdom. They believed in a literal Messiah. The problem is they just didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah because he didn't fit their mold. But they clearly believed in a literal kingdom coming. Verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Is the earth full of the knowledge of the Lord today? People rejoicing every day. and They all know the Lord. No. You see, they believe in what's called a double hermeneutic. A double hermeneutic. And in other words, they interpret and understand the scriptures, employing a dual hermeneutic, and when, and when interpreting prophetic passages of scriptures, they spiritualize them. When interpreting other parts, they believe it literally. That's why covenant theologians, conservative ones, will strongly believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. 
They will defend the inspiration of the scriptures. They will defend the deity of Jesus Christ. They'll defend his death. They'll defend his resurrection, his literal events. They'll defend all of that. But when it comes to salvation, they're less than clear. And when they come to God's plan of the future, they again mix Israel and the church and law versus grace. And they mix them into one blender and blend it all up because they have a double hermeneutic. What's the problem with it? It's unbiblical. A double hermeneutic is unbiblical. Number two, it is subject to human imagination without interpretative principles. See, if we allegorize these passages, we must use subjective human opinion and imagination to make them work. So what does the nursing child in verse 8 stand for? A newly saved Christian? The early Christian church? We can only speculate if we allegorize these things. Like, for example, in Zechariah 14, verse 9, it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. What does king mean in this verse? King. What does all mean in this verse? All. What does earth mean in this verse? Earth. That's how a dispensationalist would interpret this verse. But if you believe in covenant theology, you would have to spiritualize or allegorize the verse and say something like, the Lord rules over human hearts throughout the world and thus institutes his reign invisibly and spiritually in all the earth. They can't take it at face value. Why can't they? Because their theology won't allow them to do it. And this is why I'm going to say once and again and again, let the Bible say what it says. Just let it say what it says. It's going to agree. It's going to fit. It's all going to come together. Just let it say what it says. And the Bible, correctly understood, will then never contradict itself. Then there's Revelation 20, 1 through 7. <clears throat> then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. What does angel mean? Angel coming down from heaven means heaven having the key to a bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. By the way, does, do angels have hands? No, they're spirits, right? Do they have keys and chains? No. So that's obviously figurative language to demonstrate the fact that they have the ability in this case to, quote, lock somebody up. Who is that? He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Question, what does thousand years mean? A thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more. Nations means nations. Deceive means deceive. Till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. Now, if they had been beheaded, to see their souls means they had to have been resurrected, okay, to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Do you know how many times there Thousand. One, two, three, four, five, six times in seven verses says thousand years. And you know what the covenant theologian says? Thousand doesn't mean thousand. <laughs> it means just for a long time. Long time. Seven seals mean seven seals in the book of Revelation. Does it mean eight? Six? No, seven. Seven trumpets mean seven? 144,000 mean 144,000? Yeah. So why would we think that 1,000 doesn't mean 1,000? Is there any reason why we wanted to accept 1,000 years? 
See, so remember, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. When the plain sense of Scripture makes nonsense, there must be a figurative explanation. Is there any reason why a thousand can't mean a thousand? No, unless you're a covenant theologian with covenant theologian glasses on and say, this doesn't fit our systematic theology. And now you have a problem. A dispensationalist understands a thousand to mean a thousand. And there's good reason to do that. <clears throat> now, why is this important? It is because your beliefs about the future affect how you live today. Is there going to be a rapture of the church at any time? Is it our blessed hope? Should it have a purifying effect upon our lives? Yes. But you see, the covenant theologian doesn't believe in the rapture. He doesn't believe in a tribulation period. He doesn't believe in Christ literally coming back and setting up a kingdom on earth. He doesn't believe any of that, <clears throat> per se. Here's another theological implication. Covenant theology teaches that Israel's existence and ownership of the promised land is not permanent. Is not permanent. In other words, yes, they were given possession, they were given ownership in the Old Testament, but they blew it by rejecting Jesus Christ. Therefore, no way, Jose, are they going to have this in the future. Now, the problem with that is multiple. Let's begin looking at some scripture passages here. Genesis 12, 2 and 3, I will make you a great nation. How do we understand great nation? Great nation. I will bless you, and I'll make your name great. How do we understand make your name great? Make your name great. And you're going to be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. Bless and curse. We understand that literally. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How? Through the coming of Jesus Christ. So we would understand that literally. In Genesis 13, Verses 14 through 17. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land. How would you understand land? Land. Which you see I will give to you and your descendants for how long? Forever. And how do we understand forever? Forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. Did that happen? True. So that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its breadth, for I give it to you. So again, we see, who does the land belong to? Israel, right? Abraham and his physical descendants. See, where are they going to go here? They're going to say, well, we're spiritual descendants of Abraham. And it's not a literal land. That's how they're going to try to reason. Now, let's see what David will, or, or the psalmist will say much later. God remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his yoke to Isaac, and he confirmed it to Jacob, to Israel as a what? Everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the Land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. Question, between Abraham and the Psalms, Israel ever disobedient? If it was based on their obedience, they would have lost that a long time ago, right? But it wasn't lost. Because it wasn't based on their obedience. It was an unconditional covenant. Now, keep in mind, can you possess something that you don't live in? Yeah, possess a house, you own a house, you don't live in it, right? Some of you can relate to that. So when, there were times when Israel was out of the land. Does that mean they still didn't own it? Just because they weren't living in it? Any more than you might own an apartment that you're not living in? So, in that most of the Jews were scattered from 70 AD until 1948, when they started coming back in greater flocks than ever. Does that mean they didn't own the land as far as God is concerned? Just because they weren't living in it? 
And that's why there's more Jews living in the land today than there ever has been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They're living in the land today. Now, some people believe that Israel coming back into the land is a fulfillment of Scripture. I don't. I don't. But I do believe they need to be in the land to fulfill Scripture. Okay? Because there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be fulfilled while Israel's in the land. And now that they're in the land, they are in the place where Scripture can be fulfilled in certain ways that they couldn't be before. Here's another one. Let's go to the New Testament now. Acts 3, 25 and 26. You are the sons of the prophet and the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Does it sound like the covenant is still in place? It didn't go away, did it? How about Jeremiah 30, verse 11? I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you by way of divine discipline and dispersion. Yet I will not make a complete end of you, but I will correct you in justice and will not let you go altogether unpunished. Notice, I will not make a complete end of you. And that's been true. In fact, you know, one of the reasons you can believe the Bible is the word of God is Israel. There's no people like it ever. Hittites around today? Jebusites around today? See all these old things? You know what? There's nothing like Israel. And God said Israel will always exist. In fact, the day Israel exists is the day there won't be a sun or a moon or so forth, according to Jeremiah 33. Here's another one, Jeremiah 46, 27, and 28. But do not fear, O my servant Jacob. Do not be dismayed, O Israel. Again, references to the nation. For behold, I will save you from afar as a nation and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest and be at ease. No one shall make him afraid. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord, for I am with you. For I will make a complete end of all the nations to which I have driven you. But I will not make a complete end of you. I will rightly correct you, for I will not leave you wholly unpunished. Again, we see. God says Israel will always exist, that they will not come to an end. And we're seeing other verses that clearly indicate that, that God has given them ownership of the land. Now, how does this affect us in our day? Why is this important? Because your view of Israel and God's plan will affect how you view and respond to historical political events today. Did you know that the United Presbyterian Church of America, I think I've got it right, a few years ago actually has started boycotting any companies that did business with Israel. Do you know why? Because the Presbyterian churches are covenant theologians. They don't believe there is any future plan or blessing promise to ethnic national Israel. And they don't like some of the policies of Israel, therefore they're saying we should boycott them. Now, because we are pro-Israel, we understand that God has a plan for ethnic Israel and such. Does that mean we agree with everything Israel does? No. Does that mean we support everything they do? No. Do we understand, though, God has a plan? They are still God's chosen earthly people. And after the church is gone, the focus will be there. And that the Abrahamic covenant is still in vogue, and I will bless them that bless Israel, curse them that curses Israel. If you don't believe that's true, look at Nazi Germany and what happened to them. They cursed Israel and they got cursed, among others. Here's a third theological implication. Covenant theology teaches that the church began during Old Testament times either with Adam or Abraham. They believe the church began in Old Testament times with either Adam or Abraham. Now, what's the immediate problem with that? The church was an Old Testament mystery. 
Number two, Jesus says, I will build my church, not I have been or am. Now, do you see, understand a little more why they don't distinguish Israel and the church? Because they think the church is Israel and that the church actually began either with Adam, that's the minority view, or Abraham, that's the majority view of covenant theology. And we know from many passages 1 Corinthians 12, 13, what places you into the body of Christ is the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit, which didn't become true until the day of Pentecost, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Here, let's look here at Ephesians 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one. Who's both? Jew and Gentile. In the context, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in the flesh the enmity that is the law, abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so to create himself one new man. Who's the new man? The church. From the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them, who's them? Jews and Gentiles, both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Question, how can he reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross if they already existed in one body in the Old Testament? It doesn't make sense. I don't know how covenant theologians teach Ephesians 2 and 3. I know I heard of one who just kind of skipped over it. Or they generalize it. Because how do you deal with the passage? Ephesians 2.20, that the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. But if it started with Abraham, it should be on the foundation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, New Testament apostles and New Testament prophets. Acts 20, 28, Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. How can you have a purchased church until you have the payment made? Problematic again. Again, Jesus said, I will build my church future tense to his earthly ministry. Now why is this important again? If you merge Israel with the church, you confuse God's programs for each, and you will end up mixing law with grace. You will apply Old Testament law intended for ethnic Israel on the backs of the church today, and this will inevitably lead to Judaistic legalism infiltrating the church. And by the way, has it? Has it infiltrated the... Uh, Roman Catholic Church who isn't dispensational? Sure. You know, we'll go to a Roman Catholic Church. You know what you're going to see right up front here? An altar. You know what you're going to see behind the altar? A priest. What are you going to see behind the priest? A little box. And we you know what? He's going to open that up, and there's going to be a curtain. It's like the holiest of holies. And he's going to spread that, and he's going to reach in, and he's going to have a chalice filled with hosts, communion hosts that he's going to bless and tell you it's the literal body and blood of Christ. You know, where do you get all that from? That's the t temple, the tabernacle. Same thing. You got an altar, you got a priest, you got a holiest of holies, you've got a curtain. Where do they get that from? Where did the Lutheran church come up with a lot of their stuff that they do? They stole it right from Israel. Why did they do that? Because they think the church started with Abraham. Why do they believe again in infant baptism? Because they believe that the church is Israel and Israel is the church. And again, they circumcise in the Old Testament. Therefore, we'll enter people into the covenant community of faith in our New Testament church by way of water baptism, though we don't have one example of water baptism anywhere for infants in the New Testament but we'll still make it fit because of our theology. Theological implication number four. Covenant theology teaches that the Mosaic law is still the Christian's rule of life. 
It would be common for a person who believes covenant theology to say it's true that the Mosaic law is not the way of salvation from sin's penalty, but you still need the Mosaic law in your everyday life. The Mosaic law is an important part of the Christian's rule of life. In fact, do you realize that people who, again, who weren't dispensational, I'll just use you an example, Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was not dispensational. He was a great preacher in some ways, but he was Calvinistic in others. He wasn't dispensational. So they had classes for kids on Sundays when they came to church. Do you know what they call those classes? Sabbath classes. What do we call them? Sunday school. Why did he call them Sabbath classes? Because the Sabbath was what? Friday night to Saturday night, but this was on Sunday. So why did he call it a Sabbath class? Because he believed Israel was the church, and the church was Israel, and they, we were supposed to still keep the Sabbath, so we have to fit it somewhere, so we're going to stick it on Sunday and call it Sabbath school. Problematic. Read the book of Galatians. What drove that interpretation? His theology. His theology. And by the way, I should just say this, because I got an email about this yesterday, quoting it, Johnny Erickson Dada, that um, just because I quote somebody doesn't mean I agree with everything they believe. You know, and I'm careful about quoting certain people. I quote John MacArthur negatively. <laughs> that, does, that, does that mean I disagree with him on everything? No, I, he, I agree with him on a number of things. But on some key things, I totally disagree. On inerrancy, would I agree with him? Absolutely. In fact, he's written the best books on the charismatic movement that anyone has written. He's written three of them. Very good. I hardly disagree with anything in any of those books. And so just because I quote somebody doesn't mean I fully agree with them. In fact, I might not even agree fully with how they garble the gospel sometimes. And Johnny Erickson taught us sometimes really garbles the gospel. Just depends what paragraph you're reading. Sometimes it's really good. Other times it's like, eh, not right. But I know people who have come out of that who are very sensitive to that, and therefore it's like, how could you ever quote her? And I'm just thinking, I just quoted an accurate statement from her. That doesn't mean I endorse her. And by the way, Second Peter and Jude, do they quote the book of Enoch? Yeah. And can we agree with everything in the book of Enoch? So is it okay to quote books that you don't fully agree with? Yeah, I think it is. Just need to be wise about it. But frankly, I'm not going to, every time I quote someone, say, you know, I don't agree with everything she says, but, you know, you, you have to do that all the time. Because on those who do you fully agree with? So what does the Bible teach about this, about the Christian life and the law? For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace in the context of sanctification. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. And this is the thing you have to remember about the law. The law is an indivisible unit of 613 facets. You cannot separate and say, I'll take that part, but I'm leaving that part. And I kind of like that one there, but I really don't know. It's a unit. Either you take it or you don't. You can't pick and choose like that. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Again, he abolished the law of commandments in his flesh. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised religiously that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Why the whole law? Because it's an indivisible unit. Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet it stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. Again, why is this important? Here's why it's important. A failure to distinguish law versus grace will result in selectively carrying over Old Testament practices as well as resulting in a legalistic, works-oriented sanctification. And in fact, in many cases, even a works-oriented justification. 
Now, I'm not going to suggest that no covenant theologians aren't, are, are saved. I think there's, I'm sure they're saved ones. I'm not denying that. In fact, it's kind of interesting if you ever listen to these guys. Almost every covenant theologian that claims to be saved was led to the Lord by a non-Calvinist, non-covenant theologian. You know why? Because it's the dispensationalists who tend to get the gospel straight. Because covenant theologian, or theology has a way of kind of creating a fog on the gospel, and if they actually see that, it's more than a fog on the Christian life. And so again, what am I saying? What you believe affects how you practice, how you behave, how you think. And again, dispensational teaching isn't an overlay on the Bible, so we view it from, no, it's taken from the Bible, so we are recognizing distinctions we think are truly biblical, covenants that are clearly biblical, not man-made as it were. And therefore, we're hopefully keeping clear what God wants clear and keeping united what God wants united. Because we believe in both the unity of the Bible as well as its distinctions. Okay? Questions? Questions?